coverage of the 1980 National Farmers Organization Convention from Cincinnati, Ohio. And now, here's the address by Vice President Robert Arndt. Fellow delegates, officers, and guests of the 1980 National Convention of the National Farmers Organization. This convention is the first nationwide gathering of farm and ranch leaders in this country in this decade. Farm and ranch leaders who understand the need for profit and the know-how to achieve that profit so that we can have a prosperous agriculture in rural America and stabilize our national economy. The 1970s brought about a dramatic change in the development of technology and heavy capitalization of the agricultural industry. A dramatic change that's going to continue into the 1980s of even more importance. And this technology and the heavy capitalization of agriculture is a definite concern on the minds of those that recognize that food and fiber is of utmost importance in this nation and throughout the entire world. Because of the changes that are taking place in agriculture, we're going to see in the coming years a fading out of a system that we've known for 150 years and the phasing in of a system that has not yet been tested a system that has been tried in countries and have failed, and that is a system where outside capital is invested into an industry and hopefully that industry can sustain and maintain its efficiency as we've known in the past. These are statements that have been made, plans that have been made by those who hope to plan the destiny of you and I as farmers and ranchers in this country. There is great concern in the Department of Agriculture because an industry with a annual sales of $200 billion a year with a potential annual sales in a couple of years of $400 billion a year in a year makes that industry very tempting for those that have the ability to invest, to invest into that industry and, in the end, own it. And that industry is agriculture, the industry that you and I hope to maintain in the hands of private enterprise. Agriculture is the largest single industry in the world. It has more influence in our national economy than any other industry in this country. And we're in a revolution of change. And the concern is great. This industry has been recognized as a tremendous industry for the distribution, the production and distribution of food. We have the greatest distribution system in the world as far as getting the food from our farms to the tables of any individual in this country. And we've got food left over for a large part of the world. But there's a second distribution system that's been overlooked. And it's been intentionally overlooked. And that is the distribution of the money derived from the wealth that you and I produce. And I ask you to just spend a few minutes with me because I think it's very important that we understand how this industry fits into our national picture, how we affect the entire national economy, 
that we can better understand our responsibility as leaders of agriculture in this country. I want to give you an example. In 1979, the American farmer received $135 billion for what he sold. He sold that product at about 65% of parity. Now, a lot of people don't understand parity, but when you take all the fat out of it, you boil it down, what it amounts to is that you and I, in 1979, took a dollar's worth of our commodity to the marketplace and brought home 65 cents. Solely dollars worth for 65 cents. It meant that we left 35 cents in the marketplace for every dollar's worth that we took there. Because we paid for that commodity out of our pocket, through our labors, and the capital that we invested into it. And those that bought our commodity were largely those people that had the money to invest, corporations and corporate structures, that took that product off our hands and they got a dollar's worth of raw food and fiber and paid us 65 cents for it. What did this do in 1979 to our national economy? Well, if we had sold our commodity for a full fair price, we should have received in the neighborhood of about $200 billion, which is about $65 billion more than what we actually received. And that was largely our net profit. And we pay income tax on net profit. And just a figure, a flat figure of about 30% income tax paid on that $65 billion would have generated to our local, state, and national treasuries about $30 billion. in income tax that we never seen. 20 billion dollars that we never seen. That 20 billion dollars was never received by the local, state, and national government, the treasuries. We would have had and should have had somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 Five forty-six billion dollars left to spend of earned money that we could have spent on Main Street that we never did because we never bought it back from the marketplace. That twenty billion dollars of income tax lost in one year, what does that amount to in ten years? A short span in an economic system. Two hundred billion dollars that we will never see. How is that made up? It's got to be made up by those, either those in the laboring force by have paying a heavier share of their tax load, or it has to be made up by borrowing money, and adding into the borrowed money that's going into the economy to add to inflation. But you can see the tremendous industry, the tremendous effect we have on our national economy. That's why the concern is there. When this industry begins to change, what's going to happen to the production of food and fiber? What's going to happen to our total economic picture? The Department of Agriculture's responsibility, as they see it, the main responsibility is to see to it that the agricultural industry of this country produces enough food and fiber for the consumers of this country and as cheaply as possible and still maintain the industry. And their concern was, was great enough that earlier this year, late last year, they decided to hold meetings across the country to get a sense of direction and a sense of leadership in what they're going to be able to do so that we will have a sufficient supply of food in the next 20 years. They held structure meetings. And in these meetings, the issues were made very clear. Number one, technology is now available for rapid expansion 
and bigness in agriculture. Number two, this technology and this rapid expansion has got to be paid for. Where is the money going to come from? Who is going to put the capital into agriculture? And number three, the question is asked, can the corporate ownership, those who have the holdings of billions of dollars of finances, better utilize these, this new technology? And can they better finance the agricultural industry of the future than private ownership? And ladies and gentlemen, these are valid questions. In the minds of those who develop farm programs, who set the course of agriculture based on the old marketing system, because they have no knowledge and they have no ability to change that system. So therefore, they've got to base their decisions and their direction on a marketing system that exists today and one that ex has existed in the past. A marketing system that is owned and controlled by those that have the power to invest. Those that are free from federal and government influence. But those that have the ability to influence federal government decisions. That's where we stand. And if we want to remain dependent on federal programs and the federal government for their decisions to give us the direction that we're going to go, we're going to find that we're going to be under the influence of those that have the capital, the capital to invest and under the influence of those who have the power to influence those federal decisions and will be swallowed up because those people that have the power to invest have the, their eye on the two to four hundred billion dollar industry of net sales every year. There's profits in it and they can see it. Agriculture has a tremendous influence on our economy. But we have no influence to, di to direct the decisions made by those that are making decisions today at the federal level. So when you add it all up, we can only conclude that the only way that we're going to be able to maintain this industry in the, pri in the hands of the private enterprise system is to become free and independent from government programs, from handouts that we have had in the past, and to become free and independent from the influence of those that are buying our commodities in the marketplace. And to do it, it means that we must exchange or change the old marketing system and develop a better system in its place. That has been, it's going to be, our goal for the future, one that we will maintain and make no mistake about it. That course is the course that we're on and we will not deviate from it. It's very evident from the past that there is no government program, there is no government agency, there is no economist, there are no farm groups or organizations, or there are no corporate brain powers that have any idea how to better the system that we've had in the agricultural arena for the marketing of our commodities. There has been no new ideas. And if there are new ideas, they're choked off. Because those are the same people that want to keep the old system the way it is. There are none, except your organization, through the National Farmers Organization structure of the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system that we've set up. And why do I say that? Because there are some very basic questions that pop up every time anyone else tries to change the old marketing system. One of them is, 
What will happen to supply and demand if we give the farmers everything they want? 100% of parity. How will we keep that production coming from that farm and going into the system? How can we shake it loose if the farmer gets all the money that he needs by selling half of his commodity? These are valid questions. What will happen to the cash flow? Where will it come from? If we leave the private enterprise system intact as we've known it in the past, what will happen when that industry has got to have an additional amount of income to, or an additional amount of money to keep operating? The agricultural industry today is uh, approximately $160 billion in debt. And by 1990, it's estimated that that $160 billion is going to reach a trillion dollars. Where is that cash flow going to come from? What will happen to exports if we change our old marketing system and we raise the prices to farm producers at a parity level? Will we be able to move our commodity into the world market? How will the consumer react? Are they going to accept higher prices for food at the table, at the marketplace, or at the, at the retail level. And if they react in a bad way, are we going to be able to get reelected to our positions? The consumers make up 97% of the people in this country. Compared to 3% producers producing the food. What will happen to inflation? Big question. If we raise the price at the farm level, what's going to happen to our inflation in this country? How will the processing industry get their supply if we change the old marketing system? These are questions that have got to be answered by those that are going to change the marketing system and replace an old system with a better one. And there is no one that has that knowledge and ability except you and the National Farmers Organization and the structure that you've put together. What about supply and demand? How can we as an organization correct or create a situation where there is no concern? Supply and demand is nothing more than putting onto the market what the market needs at a fair price, and if there's anything left over, take care of it by those that produced it. It's in our membership agreement. The program is spelled out. We have it there. We have a surplus disposal plan that we can use if it ever is necessary. I don't believe it will be. But if it ever is, that concern of keeping supply and demand in balance, keeping the product flowing from the producer to the consumer at a balanced level, can be handled because of the plan that we've put together. Surplus disposal plan, a check off at the market level, the processor level, to take the excess from the market, if it ever exists, to change our marketing agreement with the processors to increase or decrease the tonnage of commodity going to that processor for the certain price level. These are things that can be done and will be done only when you and I establish contracts with the processing industry for cost of production plus a reasonable profit and the marketing terms that we've got to have as producers. It's a concern that no one can answer except this organization. Where will the cash flow come from to maintain the industry? Where does cash flow come from? It comes from the sale of that industry's production. It comes from a profit and that profit will not come about until you and I put together the resources that we have owned and control, block the commodity so that the industry cannot afford to turn it down, offer the contracts that we have to maintain, to put in and maintain cost of production, to put our marketing terms in those contracts. And when you recognize and realize that the buying industry and the processors need our product just as bad as we need to sell it every day, 
That's a reality. What other group, what other agency can create cash flow in agriculture through a profitable situation except the National Farmers Organization? There is none. And that's what we're all about. The question of what will happen to exports. Exports will continue because you and I are the source of world food supply. When you realize that we produce 60% of all the soybeans in the world, 50%, half of all the feed grains in the world, we produce 30% of all the pork, 25% of all the beef, 17% of all the milk. You've got to recognize that we are the source of world food supply. And the prices that are set on our commodities reflect world market prices. If we set the price down here, the world market price is going to be down here and it's going to be affecting every Western world country, every country in the Western world. If we set the prices up here, that's where the world market price is going to float. We will maintain our exports only at a profitable level where this nation will be able to benefit through their balance of trade. And who has the guts to set the American farm prices at a level where it belongs? You and I. There is no other one. We've heard so often that the consumer is going to have a bad reaction to the price of food. The problem is, is that no one has the ability, number one, to raise that price of food, except this organization. And number two, the increase in the price of food is not what upsets the, consuming, the consumers of this country. It's the fluctuation of the price of food. The majority of the people of this country are in a position where they've got to budget their income. They've got a budget to meet to make their house payments, to make their car payments, their boat payments, their TV payments, and whatever's left over they've got for food. And now when an increase in price of food comes about, it upsets them because they can't budget for food. Food fluctuates. They don't know what the price of a loaf of bread is going to be three months from now, or even three weeks from now, or a pound of steak, or a pound of meat of any kind. So they can't budget for food. And when you go to the retailing industry and ask why the food prices are at this level, they'll say this, the reason why is because at the farm level we had to pay this, this much two or three weeks from now, and now it's reflecting at the retail level. You can't pin them down. So your food prices are fluctuating. The only way that we're going to maintain and put stability in the food industry is for this organization to negotiate, move our commodities under contract with the processing industry and those that buy our commodities for a price that will reflect cost of production plus a profit, raise our prices up to that level, and then stabilize those prices at that level for a long period of time. At that point, we will know how much the producer of every commodity is receiving over a long given period of time. We know how much it takes to move that commodity from the farm to the processor. We know what the processing costs are. We know what the distribution costs are. They're all fixed. And once we fix our prices to a profitable level, we then will have stabilized the food industry to a point that we can go to the retail chain store and put a suggested retail price on every food item because a fluctuation will be taken out of it. And the consumer will benefit in knowing where he is week from week and month to month. Once we raise that price level and then stabilize it, 
We will stabilize the entire food industry, and it will be a benefit not only to this industry in agriculture, but to the entire consuming group of this country. And who can do that? You and I, only you and I, through this organization, collective bargaining, negotiating contracts with the industry. Inflation? What about inflation? We've been told so often that if we raise farm commodity prices, it's going to create a situation of inflation in this country that won't stop. Don't you ever believe it. Because if fair farm prices cause inflation, we should have had no inflation since 1952. It's been only since 1952 that when farm prices began to drop, the inflation began to heat up. Why? Inflation is nothing more than a situation that happens from borrowing money, throwing it out into the economy, and not repaying that debt, leaving the borrowed money out there. If you and I were going to purchase an item that cost $1,000, and we had to borrow the $1,000 to buy it. And we put that $1,000 of borrowed money out into the economy, but didn't have the ability to repay it. It stays out there. But it doesn't just hang on a tree. Somebody's going to get it. And there are only three major segments in our economy. You've got labor, you've got industry, and agriculture. Now, labor is in a position to get their share of that $1,000. They can call it strikes, contracts with management, but they're in a position to get their share of that borrowed money. Industry is in a position to get their share because all they've got to do is raise the prices of the commodities that they manufacture and put on the market. Agriculture is not in that position. Agriculture has got to pay for the higher labor costs that reflected the borrowed dollars that got thrown out there. They've got to pay for the higher industrial costs. But being that they don't have the ability to raise their prices, what does agriculture have to do? They borrow some more money and throw it out in the, in the economy the next time around, and not having the ability to pay it back. That borrowed money that agriculture is throwing out there is then being divided between labor and industry, and you have another round of inflation. And I'll defy any economist, politician, to say that they can curb inflation without bringing the agricultural profit into the picture and bringing agriculture together with labor and industry at an equal level. It can't happen. So who can control inflation? Who can bring the inflation spiral to a halt and reverse it? You and I, through this organization, through pre-negotiated contracts with the buyers of our commodity, that we can get the profits that we need to pay for the debt that we have, put those borrowed, take those borrowed dollars that we've got out there, put them back into the shelves of the banks and the industry that loan them to us, that those borrowed dollars can be invested into new business and new industry that can hire new labor to earn the earned dollars that we've earned from the marketplace. It's the only way that this national economy will ever turn itself around from its inflated situation. It's a responsibility that rests heavy on our shoulders as producers of food and fiber. But it's a responsibility that is no greater than the ability that we have to correct it. It's a comforting thought 
to know that we have a system now organized, a structure put together, that we can bring the farm commodities that are so important to us and our national economy in a position to cause the industry that buys them to pay a profitable price, that we can maintain our industry, we can create our own cash flow, pay off debt, and stabilize the entire national economy. One of the concerns of the processing industry is how will they get their supply of food and fiber if the old marketing picture, the old marketing structure is put aside and a new structure in its place. They have a real concern, and it's a responsibility on our part as an organization to see to it that if we replace the old system with a new and better system, the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system, that for every contract we write for the prices that we need, we must fulfill the contracts with the production that we've guaranteed the processing industry. Once we have established that with the industry, they'll accept the idea of contracting their supply through this organization. They have a concern, and that it's our responsibility to see to it that that concern is met. Now, this means that you and I, through this organization, are the only people who have the ability, the resources, and the knowledge to bring together a power block of people, a power block of commodity, and a power block of finance, so that we can effect and create and influence the processing industry and influence the political arena so that we can maintain a strong agriculture and bring a stability to the national economy. That we have within this group. You are the leadership in agriculture because you have that ability that no one else has. It means that a team of farmers working together at all levels, no matter what commodity is produced, if we have the total vision of the total picture of what we can do on a national scale, if we can catch that vision, and then with your leadership, go back home to your geographic areas and apply your leadership to your counties or to your township structures to develop the product and block it together to fit into the total scope, the total national picture. We will then have achieved the leadership at all levels and the ability to carry out every goal that we've set. That's what this convention is all about. To keep us divided means that those that have profited from cheap raw materials in the past will continue to profit from those cheap raw materials and set the course of agriculture in this decade. And that doesn't have to happen. Because you and I are each an independent part of a gigantic industry. And together we make up the largest and most influential industry in the world. And all we need to do is to bring together our thoughts, our resources, catch the vision of the total picture, and we will have developed the most powerful industry that this country has ever seen. And it'll be in the hands of private enterprise. And not the corporate power structures that we've seen developed in all the other segments. Well, where are we as an organization? Tonight, 
Your president, Devon Woodland, is going to give the State of Affairs Address. But I want to just point out a few basic things that has happened and what's come about. 1958, when we began organizing and putting together people, we organized under a philosophy and a theory that if we had enough people together and we got the people emotionalized heavy enough, strong enough in a large enough area, we will bring about change through the emotions of people. We organized under that theory for 10 or 12 years. But to organize under on emotions alone leaves a foundation of sand because those emotions never last. We organized rapidly in hopes that the emotions of the people that we put together would create enough structure in enough area so that the fast organizing that we done would create enough production going through a system that we didn't have that we could pay for the organizing after we done it. Well, we didn't have the expertise. We didn't have the knowledge of every step we had to make. We done it by trial and error. And we created a situation in this organization whereby we put together a tremendous powerful structure of people. We had an idea of how we could move that production to the industry. We never had the expertise to do it. We put ourselves in a bad financial position. We came out of it. We paid for it out of our own pocket, and you know how we paid. That situation was changed about two years ago. We recognize that we can't organize on emotions alone, that we cannot gunshot our programs into all areas and hope to pay for them after the fact. So we recognize that we had to make a change within this organization in the thinking of how we're going to reach the goals that we're after. And the approach that we took came from the approach of emotionalizing people alone to the approach of becoming a organization with a business sense. And to do that, we had to develop a department, a budget department, to know and monitor where we are from day to day, how fast we can expand, where we can spend our dollars and still keep the organization from getting deep into debt where we can't crawl out from underneath it. To pay our way as we go along. Develop programs with reasonable goals. To do that, we had to make some tremendous changes. We had to, first of all, get ourselves out of a debt situation as an organization. And to do that, we had to cut our staff. And we made some deep cuts in all commodities, in nearly all areas. It left a greater responsibility on the shoulders of those that were in the counties, elected people. Because with fewer staff people out there assisting, it meant that our elected leadership had to pick up that gap that was left and continue to build the programs that we had. We've come through that phase over the past two years. We've turned this organization around to where we've got the respect of the industry, of the political arena, of the financial world. We now are in a position where we can build for growth and budget for growth. But it's going to take a teamwork of the staff people that we have in the country and the teamwork of those staff people and the elected leadership and the membership in general because it's a total team effort of farm producers across this country that's going to maintain our, reach our goals. One thing we want to keep in mind, and that is that prices are set by those that have the power to set them. And ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it. This organization intends to set the prices and have the power to set them 
We intend to be the source of markets in this country and to maintain those markets through pre-negotiated contracts with the industry. That's our goal, and we will not deviate from that goal. There's going to be changes made, and we're going to have to face the fact that we came from an, uh, from an era of 20 years ago when we had somewhere between three and a half and four million producers, smaller operators, producers that did not depend as heavily on capital as we are depending on it today. Today we have somewhere between 600,000 and 800,000 producers in this country producing 80% of all the food and fiber. Their dependency on capital is much greater than it was 20 years ago. And some of the direction and programs that we need established have got to keep that in mind. To keep our course on our goal, not deviate from it. But if we've got to make small changes, and even some major ones, we need to look at it as an organization and look at it as a need so that we can continue on course and involve those who have had to change their farming operations from what it was 20 years ago. We must be flexible, not only in our bargaining, we've got to be flexible in our thinking as an organization. That's why this convention and those meetings and conventions that follow are going to be so important that when we come to these conventions, that your input, your knowledge, your ability, and your flexibility will help to set the course for agriculture in the future. We have the new order of marketing and bargaining established. We've got the people in the agricultural industry. We've got the leadership. They're right here. We've got the production, and we've got the finances among us. We've got the ability to block huge blocks of production together, to influence the processing industry, to sit down and negotiate contracts with our terms in them. We've accepted no grants, we've accepted no handouts from government or industry. We have no strings attached to anyone. We paid for every step of building our structure out of our own pocket. We are the largest industry in the world free to maneuver in any direction we want to take it because we've got the structure and the knowledge to take this food and fiber that you and I are owners of, the first owners, and move it in any direction, offer it to any buyer under contracts that we write. And we have the right to do all of this because of federal legislation, the Capra-Volstead Act that was given to us in 1922. And ladies and gentlemen, when you think about that, there is no group of producers and business or industry anywhere in this world that has that right and ability that you and I have. That makes you and I the most influential people going into this, decade, into this coming decade. And those that set the price of our farm commodities will be in control of this industry by the end of this decade. If the corporate structure sets the price and continues to set that price, and we let them, by the end of this decade, they're going to own and control agriculture. There is no way of getting around it.
you and I, and this convention, will determine who's going to control agriculture in the 1980s. And that determination can only come from the leadership that this organization has, the only leadership, meaningful leadership, that agriculture has in this country. So when you go tomorrow to the commodity meeting, keep that in mind. Take pencil and tablet with you, and when you sit down in these commodity meetings, keep in mind that what you hear Think about how it will apply to your area when you go back home.